All right, uh, welcome. Thanks for uh, logging in to the proposed amendment to the water cycling funding program guidelines. Uh, full disclosure, we don't have anyone in the room in Sacramento, uh, so we're interested if there are people uh, logged into the webcast, would you mind sending an email to cleanwatersrf at waterboards.ca.gov um, and let us know if you're, if you're logging in. Um, and uh, we do have the ability to take questions from that email address uh, throughout the workshop. Um, and we're just interested in attendance. I know there's a slight delay in the web feed, so um, I'm going to go ahead and continue. And if you let me know if uh, we receive any emails, that'd be great. So uh, my name is Mike Downey. I'm the funding program manager for the Water Cycling Funding Program. And uh, with us in the room also, Christopher Stevens, who's the section chief for the SRF uh, programs and water cycling programs, and Jim Mon, who's the assistant deputy director for uh, Division of Financial Assistance, Loans and Grants branch. So today, uh, we're just going to talk about quickly the guidelines and our proposed amendment, and talk about the purpose of the guidelines and a brief background. Uh, the main objectives for amending the guidelines at this time, the few notable changes we'd like to highlight, and then the schedule. Once again, that email address is on that slide, cleanwatersrf at waterboards.ca.gov. So the purpose of the water cycling guidelines um, is to act as DFA's standard operating procedure to process applications and to execute funding agreements for water recycling projects. So that's, that's why we use the document. Um, it provides clarity for both applicants and us about our process and how you should be involved. Uh, additionally, guidelines are required by Proposition 1 and 68, which we received water recycling funding through. Um, and Occasionally, uh, they may be required by future propositions. So the guidelines were last amended in June 16th, 2015. Uh, that was shortly following the passage of Prop 1, uh, where we received the bulk of our water cycling funding at the time. Um, and the guidelines have and continue to work in conjunction with the Clean Water State Revolving Fund policy and the Clean Water SRF intended use plan. Um, so that's been true before, that continues to be true. The policy was last amended in November 2018, and the intended use plan is adopted annually and acts as the business plan for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, so the, the fiscal year 2019-20 IUP was adopted by the board in June of 2019. So we had a few main objectives uh, for amending the guidelines at this time. Uh, one of the key ones was mostly for revisions for organization, clarity, and simplification. And uh, you'll notice that we did not put out a red line markup version um, from the past guidelines to what we're proposing, and that's merely because so much was moved and rearranged that it was, it was not helpful. So uh, not to say that so much has changed in the guidelines, just that we've moved it and better organized it. Uh, along that same line, uh, we want to better integrate with the Clean Water State Revolving Fund policy and procedures. And as I mentioned, we were already referencing the Clean Water SRF policy, and we continue to do so. And what we did in this uh, proposed draft is to remove anything that the Clean Water SRF policy already discusses. So for example, disbursement requests for construction projects are clearly, the procedure is clearly outlined in the SRF policy. We don't discuss it in the guidelines, 
and you say, please refer to the SRF policy for that. Uh, next, we did want the guidelines to act as long-term guidance uh, and not be so dependent on individual bond measures. In our, in our current guidelines, we make specific reference to Prop 1, Prop 13, funding limitations, and rules that come with those uh, revenue sources. And what we would like to do is be prepared for that next bond measure that passes. We can use these guidelines to administer the funds um, and that these will act as the guidelines for future bond measures. It gives us a little bit more flexibility. Uh, so one way we're also doing that is, is in the intended use plan uh, every year it outlines the funds we have available and our plan for that year for committing those grant or loan funds for water cycling projects. So we've been doing that in the past. We're continuing to do that. Uh, and we feel that that's a better mechanism for you know, explaining to agencies what are the funds that are appropriated to us that we have access to for this upcoming fiscal year and not include that in the guidelines which need to be updated every time that changes. Uh, and lastly, we did uh, want to strengthen guidance regarding recycled water research and recycled water pilot projects. Uh, they are mentioned in the previous version of the guidelines, and we just pro provided a little bit more guidance on those topics. Uh, there are a few notable changes we wanted to highlight. Um, Planning grants for disadvantaged communities, the construction grant calculation and maximums, and then a uh, processing priority. And so I'm going to talk about those on the next few slides in more detail. So currently and in the proposed guidelines, uh, planning grants uh, are eligible for 50% of planning costs up to the maximum that's listed in the Clean Water SRF intended use plan. The change here is that we're proposing disadvantaged communities or severely disadvantaged communities can receive 100% of eligible planning costs up to the maximum. So it continues to be 50% to do a recycled water feasibility study, a 50% grant, uh, and then DACs or severely DACs can get 100%. Um, another notable change is adjusting the construction grant calculation. And we had a few reasons why we felt it's worth uh, revisiting this calculation. Uh, mainly, it's eliminating conflicting interpretations that are existing in the guidelines currently. Um, at the same time, we'd like to simplify the grant calculation which uh, will make our reviews a little quicker, as well as our disbursement reviews. Uh, we'd like to allow agencies to utilize 100% of the grant commitment. And what I mean by that is currently um, there is grant committed, and agencies are having trouble uh, coming up with enough actual costs by the end of the project to use it, um, which leads to very late change orders, additional construction contracts added, trying to make use of that grant commitment. Um, so we'd like agencies to be able to utilize that more easily, um, which leads to the last bullet, which is we would also like to disencumber less grant from projects. Um, better for the agencies, better for us as well. So. I have here a table kind of comparing uh, currently the construction grant calculation, uh, what's in the guidelines and what we do, and what we're proposing. So currently, uh, construction grant is calculated as 35% of eligible estimated costs. And what we're proposing is to keep that the same, 35% of eligible estimated costs. Now, where it starts to change is that currently, those eligible costs are construction and partial construction allowances. Construction allowances being construction management, change orders, engineering during construction. Um, what we're proposing is part of the simplification, 
uh, just construction costs would be eligible for grant, for the grant calculation. <clears throat> Currently, the construction grant is confirmed or reduced during the final budget based on the selected construction <coughs> bid. So your grant is set in your initial agreement, and when your bids come in, if they are exactly what you estimated, then that's your grant amount. If the bids come in low, we're reducing that grant amount. Um, what we're proposing instead is that the grant amount is unchanged during the final budget, regardless of the selected construction bid. So the construction grant calculation is purely based on the estimated costs at the beginning, um, and that doesn't change. So the way that helps both of us is that currently there are limitations applied to dispersing the grant. Right? So it's 35% of your actual invoice costs turn into a grant that's dispersed on each disbursement request because we need to maintain that 35% of grant eligible costs throughout the length of the project. By changing that, um, we're recommending the eligible costs can be reimbursed up to the original grant amount. So if, if we so choose, uh, we could disperse grant first, uh, as long as you have actual invoiced costs that you can provide. And we're not trying to maintain this exact 35% because the grant that's committed is what um, you can draw on. Uh, and then finally, the maximum is currently established in the guidelines, and we're proposing to move the maximum only to the Clean Water SRF intended use plan. Um, and that is mostly so we can be more flexible um, and set the maximum grants at an appropriate level for the amount of funds we have available for that fiscal year. Uh, so for example, in this year's intended use plan, we set the maximum at $5 million. And that's mainly due to the fact that our Prop 1 grant has been depleted, it's been given out. Um, and we were just appropriated Prop 68, but that is around $40 million. And with the amount of fundable projects on the fundable list and the amount of grant we have, we felt that that was an appropriate level um, to administer a grant across the state for projects, water cycling projects. Um, I will ask you to hold your questions until the end. Thanks. So lastly, the proposed processing priority. Um, and I'd like to start by saying that grant is not committed as part of our process until an initial agreement begins drafting. There are a few steps to get there. Uh, one, you must be on the fundable list. Uh, the Clean Water SRF policy, as I mentioned, was amended in uh, November of last year, and that created the scoring criteria um, and so you must be on the fundable list, first and foremost, to get an agreement in the fiscal year. Uh, secondly, all the reviews and checklists must be complete. We need to receive a complete application uh, from the agencies, and it needs to be ready to proceed uh, with an initial agreement. So those are the main things that will determine when you're getting a grant commitment. Now, we recognize that there may be cases where there's multiple projects that are ready to go, complete application, and we're only limited on our project manager's workload capacity to process it. And in the cases that which ones we work on determines which one gets to an initial agreement first, um, if that is going to be the determining factor, we want to have a, a processing priority and make that clear. So. Um, this is what we're proposing, and we'd love to get feedback on it. Um, love to receive some comment letters and see if you have a, a, a way that uh, more fairly or clearly or uh, you think is, is better for creating a priority list. So uh, our, our priorities are severely disadvantaged communities or projects that support the human right to water. Uh, next would be potable reuse projects that increase the drinking water supply. Uh, potable reuse projects being groundwater augmentation, reservoir water augmentation, raw water augmentation, 
drinking water augmentation. I realize some of those don't have standard uh, regulations created yet. Uh, next would be projects that construct or extend recycled water distribution systems. So just the conveyance pipeline and laterals for delivering recycled water. Uh, and then finally, those projects which are expanding or constructing treatment facilities. All right, so our schedule, the guidelines were posted for public comment on August 9th. Uh, today, you are here at the Sacramento workshop, and we have two workshops next week, uh, one in Fresno, one in Orange County. The deadline for comments is September 12th, and our intention is to bring this before the board at the October 15th board meeting for adoption. So if you'd like to submit a comment, uh, please submit it to Janine Townsend, clerk to the board, um, or you can also email PDF letters uh, to comment letters at waterboards.ca.gov. That should be the same as what's listed in the public comment notice. If you don't have an official comment, but just have questions or would like to externally process what uh, the changes are, please contact myself or Jody Hack, who's a project manager in the unit. Thank you, Jody. Um, and we can help you, and we can also advise you on how to officially make the comments. Um, it's in small letters down there, but uh, that is our website, our, uh, our webpage, and the guidelines are posted there. Um, if for some reason you're having a hard time finding it, please email us. We can point in the right direction. this time if there are any questions or discussion and we'll also be looking uh, to the web if you had emailed in some questions we can answer those as well Mike just to add a, a quick uh, a note on there I think we had talked about uh, posting the video of today's webcast as well as the slides on the website uh, for people later on that's right so we'll post those um, and we can send out a, a, a Lyris blast to let you know when it's when it's up and posted. Then a quick question. So I think September twelfth. What date? What day is that? You know what day that is? That's a great question. Thursday, Thursday September twelfth. Right. Okay. So we'll we'll not interrupt your three day weekend. Um, so with that, I think we'll go ahead and close the workshop. We appreciate you all for attending. And uh, again, if you have questions uh, prior to the deadline for comments, please give us a call. If you have questions following the deadline for comments, you can also call us. Thank you.